Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here. As usual, just taking a break to watch some movies and relax and do whatever I want. You know, since I'm still on Christmas vacation before I can end up uh, going back. Well, anyway, um, of course, I always picked up all the DVDs and Blu-rays, you know, from Dollar Tree. And I just want to review the franchise collection of Beethoven. Yeah, America's favorite lovable St. Bernard, who can get into bigger trouble, being adopted by the Newton family. <laughs> yeah, played by Charles Grodin, along with uh, Bonnie Hunt, uh, Nicole Tom, Christopher Castell, and Sarah Rose Carr. Yeah. Um, now, this is, of course, the franchise collection that carries five films. It's the Pooch Pack. That I picked up at Dollar Tree. I was a bit surprised to find this. Yeah, because not only do you have the first two films, you know, Beethoven and Beethoven Second, both of which were theatrically released, but you get the uh, the last three films that are direct to video, which has some various actors to play. You know, like Judge Ryan Hall, uh, John Larroquette, and even Kathy Griffin. Yeah, come to mind. Um, which actually has eight films, though, because it follows um, movies like Big Break, um, Christmas Adventure, and Treasure Tale. That's the last one. Unless they're going to end up making more, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Just a flipper disc. Yeah. Um, but it does carry all the movies. And they're all on widescreen. Um, but it does have a Blu-ray release um, that came out a few years ago. Uh, the transfer actually looks excellent. But I do wish there's features included. I mean, come on. I wish they had a featurette. I wish they had uh, some other stuff that would have been included. Maybe even bloopers. But sadly, um, the only extras they have were basically directly from, well, uh, I think from the fifth one, so, sadly. Um, I, I do hope that Beethoven Second does get a Blu-ray release from Universal, because they haven't released it yet. I guarantee you the transfer will look even better. Um, but it's a very popular uh, franchise, per se. I mean, it's what started it all. Of course, this is the second St. Bernard after Cujo. So the difference here is that you get one St. Bernard that's, that turns evil out to be bitten by a rabbit bat, and then you get another St. Bernard who's very smart and intelligent. You can get into bigger trouble, but nevertheless, he's family. <laughs> okay. Um, but I just want to review the first two films for now. If I thought about getting into the direct-to-video sequels, I will. But I guarantee you, it's not going to be pretty. Because to be fair, we, we were better off having the first two films as it is. Because I like it better when it was just the Newton family. You know, with Charles Grodin and Bonnie Hunt. The first time I saw Beethoven, I saw this as a double feature with... Ferngelly, The Last Rainforest, as I mentioned, because I did do the review. Um, it was actually we went to see a triple feature because first we went to see Sister Act at AMC in Burbank, California, and then later we went to see Beethoven along with Ferngelly as a double feature. So it was really fun. I mean, because it was Memorial Day weekend, and you know we had to take some time to just you know relax and you know, have fun and do a lot of stuff before we had to go back to school <laughs> or work or whatever. Um, and when I first saw Beethoven, I was laughing hysterically. I love it. It was fun to watch um, a dog film or any other pet film that we got. But this one, you know, could do anything. I mean, seeing how cute he is, but yet he can get into bigger trouble no matter what. 
and he's trying to escape from these uh, evil veterinarian joining in with two crooks who are about to steal all the puppies at this rate dogs alone just for an evil experiment like they just want to kill them all and it's I know it's it's very cruel but you have the Newton family to back up I mean even though the father who's a workaholic didn't want him because he didn't want to take the responsibility. He's also paranoid too and, and he could be grumpy, stubborn. I mean he cares more about um, his promotion than his even though he does love his family and his wife, his kids. You know, he's trying to take care of them, you know, trying you know, just so they can, you know, be able to survive through all this uh, havoc that's going around. But the way they've been treating them, it's just, yeah, having to deal with snobs and babysitters and everyone else. I mean, you, it's not easy. So they knew that Beethoven is the hero of the kind. Yeah. So, and I did, and not only did I saw the movie in theaters, but we later rented it on home video. Never get tired of it, and I, I, I even taped it on TV. Uh, once um, it was on Fox I was actually hoping there were going to be deleted scenes because usually when they play it on TV they always put deleted scenes that were left off from the theatrical release um, but they did play it on TV mostly because um, HBO, Showtime the movie channel and, and even Cinemax couldn't carry the film I guess this was the idea of having networks play it after um, they end their run on pay-per-view and or the fact that you know they haven't been able to pick them up yet so apparently networks like NBC and Fox will pick up universal titles and they can often put like deleted scenes or any of that stuff so that was always the case uh, and that's before you know cable networks have picked them up you know like USA Network or and sometimes uh, even HBO, Cinemax, Showtime, the movie channel would pick them up themselves. Or even Stars and Uncore for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, and that's long before streaming. <laughs> long before that. And of course, you know, DVDs, VHS, and Laserdisc. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Um, and I know this films get criticized these days. I mean, but thank goodness uh, Cinema Score got it right. They gave it an A, and it's one of the rarest times that I agree. I mean, people said, "Oh yeah, it's stupid, it's ridiculous," but they're actually missing the point. They really are. Um, but of course. Uh, since the series was so popular because it was a huge hit at the box office, I mean, it made basically it made um, a lot more than than we expected, so enough to earn a sequel, which is uh, hundred, uh, which uh, at the box office it was one hundred and forty-seven point two million dollars out of its eighteen million budget. It was really surprising, and it was so popular that not only we got a second one, but we also had a video game or I think they were going to get a video game, but I think eventually, I think that went, um, I think it was never released. I mean, it was completed, but it was never released. And they actually had um, a TV series, an animated TV series, which I never saw. Uh, I think it aired on the, whatever network it was. It could be CBS. And it was produced by um, Ivan Reitman with his production company, Northern Lights Entertainment, long before for his second production company, um, the Montecito Picture Company. This was after, of course, the success of Kindergarten Cop that he would want to produce these films. And we actually joined in by John Hughes, which eventually was given a, a name acronym of Edmond Dantes, yeah, named after yeah, the Musketeers. I guess he was a big fan of of the Free Musketeers, so maybe he wanted to adopt that name. 
so he doesn't want to get involved or even mentioned. Um, joining in with Amy Holden Jones, and also have um, producer who's also the artist, uh, Michael C. Gross. Uh, no, not Michael Gross from uh, the TV show um, Family Ties and, and the Tremors films. No, this is a different Michael C. Gross who, who created uh, the National Lampoon magazine. And with Joe uh, Mayuk, Canadian producer. Yeah, with with Brian Levant uh, directing this, uh, yeah, because this was before he went on to direct films like The Flintstones and uh, Jingle All the Way, among other films. I know, I'm getting to it. With Beethoven, stars Charles Grodin, who's been best known for films like The Heartbreak Kid, the original, along with um, Midnight Run and Clifford. No, not Clifford the Big Red Dog, but uh, the movie with Barn Short playing a 10-year-old boy who loves to create, uh, who's a troublemaker trying to create havoc, including his uncle who was played by him, uh, along with Mary Steenburgen. Yeah. Bonnie Hunt, um, surprisingly very young, too, at her age. I mean, considering how old Golden is. But she, she went on to do other films like Jerry Maguire, as well as uh, Return to Me, which, interesting enough, um, does feature uh, David Duchovny, who's in the movie, which I'm going to get to. Um, Dean Jones, um, who's been a long-time um, collaborator with the live-action Disney films uh, from during his uh, era, like in the I think back in the the '60s, you know, with films like. Uh, the Love Bug, That Darn Cat, yeah, The Million Dollar Duck, that sort of thing. Uh, Nicole Tom, who went on to do the TV series uh, The Nanny. Yep, that was her. Christopher Castell from the TV series Step by Step. Sarah Rose Carr from Kindergarten Cop. Oliver Platt, who was previously in the film the original Flatliners. Yeah, and he went on to do other films like The Three Musketeers, uh, Executive Decision, uh, among others. Stanley Tucci, yeah, he's been known for many roles he's been in, uh, such as um, The Terminal with Tom Hanks and Catherine Zeta Jones. And he's done a lot of work of certain films that we could talk about. David the Cubney, uh, long before he went on to do The X Files, a year later, and of course he was in Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, and went on to do Evolution, which was directed by Ivor Reitman. Patricia Heaton, uh, long before she went on to do the show Everybody Loves Raymond, along with The Middle, and a few films here and there, especially uh, Space Jam. Uh, Laura Cronin, Nancy Fish, Richard Pronnell in an uncredited role, and, interesting enough, Joseph Gordon-Levitt in one of his earlier roles. But it was a tiny role before he became well-known. Yeah, because he was doing commercials at the time. It's written by John Hughes uh, with Amy Holden Jones, and it's directed by Brian Levant. The movie began set in Valley Vista, California. We meet an evil veterinarian named Dr. Herman Barnick, played by Dean Jones, who hired two thieves named Harvey and Burnham, both played by Oliver Platt and Stanley Tucci, to steal a group of puppies at a local pet store. That includes uh, a St. Bernard puppy, not given a name yet, and a Jack Russell Terrier which they both escaped from a big truck through the cages which all the dogs were in they ran away as fast as they can I mean the Jack Russell Terrier named, which was named Sparky um, was about to find where the St. Bernard is but he just ran off on his own while the St. Bernard is, is hidden inside the trash can until the next morning 
when he was trying to find a place to stay, only to to get almost attacked by a white cat that looks like Jackie, our Jackie. He found one, and that turned out to be the Newton family, where we meet uh, a workaholic father named George uh, Newton, played by Charles Grodin, who's joined in with his wife, Alice, and their children, Rice, Ted, and Emily. They're all played by Bonnie Hunt, uh, Nicole Tom, Christopher Castell, and Sarah Rose Carr. Uh, George, on the other hand, works at a business firm which they sell car air fresheners. Yeah. And that could be used for not only cars, but trucks as well. Um, and, um, you know, Rice is a teenager. Ted is just a young boy, and Emily is just a, a toddler. Well, a little girl. Alice is very caring. Um, so to me, this was the kind of family that you can deal with, even though, and, and they're very heartwarming. And you can deal with what they're overcoming from their problems because in the way they're being treated and everything. So they sort of feel like an underdog in the, in the family. So anyway, George, uh, doesn't want to take the responsibility of taking care of the dog or even owning it. So they convinced them to actually give him a chance, you know, until they try to find a new home for him, see if, if they can accept. But, well, George would probably take his chances and decided, well, okay, keep him for a while, but let's just see what happens. Well, Next thing you know, they were trying to give him a name, and as far as it's concerned, when Emily plays a portion of Lurick's band Beethoven, Fifth Symphony, on the piano, that's when, well, George actually named them Beethoven. So now, our St. Bernard Beethoven, uh, throughout the, for the past couple months, or several weeks, he, he was fully grown. I mean, already, you know, he's just um, already becoming the family. You know, they, they started feeding him with tons of dog food. And they started walking with him and doing all this other activity, doing everything. But he does get into bigger trouble by going around, you know, escaping through the doghouse. You know, digging deeper, you know, just going around. Also, you know, just going around having some turkey during Thanksgiving with the family. Or, you know, going around chewing and slobbering all, all this clothes and stuff. And even peeing on it too. And pooping on the carpet. And yes, even going all the way on top of the bedroom. Yeah, you know, the family's bedroom. Where he goes around um, all covered in mud. With all that slobber and starts to shake it off. And that's where you get all the mess that <laughs> that George has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially when the song uh, Roll Over Beethoven is played by uh, Paul Schaefer and the world's most dangerous band. Yep. And Paul Schaefer, for those who don't know, of course, is from, who's been known for uh, becoming part of the uh, the band for. Late Night with David Letterman, which later become Late Show with David Letterman when it was on CBS, but it, but it's always been on NBC. Which is a cover version of uh, Chuck Berry's song. Yeah. Also, since Beethoven became an adult dog, he actually became part of the family by helping the children overcome their problems, such as helping Rice uh, talk to her crush, because she's very shy. Um, he actually scares off all these bullies. They're they're teasing the Ted. Yeah, we have these three guys. You know, started pouring the milk on on the sandwich and started picking on him at the school bus. You know, just taking his backpack away, and he was ready to actually beat them up. You know, with Beethoven backing them up. So, 
And I, I love that scene where he was trying to show his muscles and stuff. <laughs> trying to look uh, good so he can... So when those bullies come back, he'll he'll be ready for them. And, and of course, he even saves uh, Emily's life when she fell from a swimming pool just when the, um, they hire a babysitter to take good care of them. You know, em yeah, Emily, Rice, and Ted. Um, yeah, when well, she was very, well, she was very irresponsible for that because she, she was just going around playing the piano, trying to watch them, but apparently she wasn't paying attention by watching the Emily from playing a, a, a bouncing ball and fell into the swimming pool, so Beethoven came to the rescue. But then Beethoven had to go back to his doghouse because, of course, he overheard. See, it just shows that Beethoven can do anything. That's why he's smart and intelligent. Um, so, of course, um, he, she got fired for that. So now um, Alice came by, picked him up, and went back home. But George, on the other hand, got completely jealous that he felt neglected through his family, thinking that his family loves Beethoven more than he does. So, plus he gets all paranoid and, and stubborn and angry. Also the fact that um, there's two uh, snobbish um, executives uh, named Brad and Bree, both played by David Duchovny and Patricia Heaton, who want to uh, expand um, Newton's um, business firm, which is the air freshener, so that way they can earn more money, so that way they'll have a bigger business. So they'll be able to sell this company um, nationwide. But, of course, both of them had treated um, his family in like dirt, that next thing you know, you know, Beethoven had taken the matters of their own hands by actually being, get this, because when they're having a barbecue and, and was forcing the, you know, George to sign the, the contract, uh, Beethoven just, uh, <laughs> runs around in the leash that he was tied onto the table and goes around through the chairs of both um, Bree and, and Brad and that's when the, uh, Brad just throws the, the squash ball you know that way you know Beethoven can fetch and that's when the the, the leash actually connects to the table and the chairs and Beethoven just ran as fast as he can with them, so it just chases them off. <laughs> so yes, they're like going all the way, you know, they're swinging around through the chairs, and then they, they're going all the way, jump up to the fence, just as Beethoven jumps up, and they suddenly look like they're just, they're doing a somersault all the way through the chairs, and then, then they landed uh, onto the, the ground. And the, the table, all standing still, and then, and Beethoven just continues. <laughs> and then George just calls him bad dog, and <laughs> that was a very funny scene. That's when um, Alice explains to George that, um, that he really didn't like these people and the way they're treating them. But George doesn't seem to understand because he just... He doesn't like the dog, the way, you know, the dog's been treating them, or anybody, or even him. So he felt like, you know, the dog needs to go. You know, because he's caused nothing but trouble. And that's where they overheard. The Newtons had taken Beethoven to um, Barnick, um, just to have a checkup, you know, for medical examinations and immunizations. But that's where Barnick suddenly lies to him, saying that, you know, that St. Bernard's can be potentially dangerous to humans, advises them to watch Beethoven closely for any signs of viciousness. Yeah. Well, Beethoven is no Cujo, that's for sure. But, I know. Because to make matters worse, 
Dr. Vardnik actually visits um, the Newton home, and that's where he starts to put fake blood on him, pretending that Beethoven is attacking him. And given all these uh, these uh, bites on his arm, like there's blood on his face, blood on him, you know, having all these marks. Uh, but Emily, on the other hand, spotted uh, Bartnick by slapping the Beethoven in the face. He knows that for this, the whole time that Bartnick is the one that's doing this, not Beethoven. So, and because of that, he was about to press charges against uh, Newton by um, getting attacked, and hope, and he was actually threatening to get this, Ufernized him. Yeah, they're going to kill him. At this rate, uh, George decided to take uh, Beethoven to the vets. So that way he'll be sentenced to be unoofanized. So, big mistake. Totally big mistake. Um, the, the family was all upset about that. Even Emily called George a dog killer. So, George actually felt that he wasn't so sure if he did the right thing or he did the wrong thing, but at this rate, he did do the wrong thing. So he thought that because things are not going so right in the world, because now he realized um, that maybe you know Beethoven was really best to be coming back to their lives, because after all, Beethoven did help them out. So he thought the best solution to to solve this problem was well have George change his ways and finally get back Beethoven where they belong that's where he is about to go after Dr. Bardnick by going inside his office only to find out that Beethoven is not here he's being sentenced to um, the factory that's where we found out that Varnick lied he didn't have any bites whatsoever. There's no blood. There's no stitches. I mean, considering he wrapped him up. So Emily uh, already knew that he he was lying. So that's where he was about to tell him where he is. And then that's where he was ready to punch him in the face. Uh, he was going to you know, be able to have him arrested for assault and battery. But who cares? I mean, he deserved that punch. So now he was about to call them to see that how Varnick actually lied to them that he actually took them for animal abuse so that way by the time Dr. Varnick had left at his office and was ready to go straight to the factory that's when the, the Newton family were about to follow them and that's where we see um, you know both uh, Harvey and Burnin ready to burn all their files and was ready to go around killing all these dogs that have them in cages. George came along uh, while uh, Alice was about to call the police and um, in the 40s too. Well, <laughs> while Rice, uh, Ted and Emily were in the car, um, Ted eventually drives the car so that way he can crash into the factory while um, George actually jumps out of the the roof window and landed straight into um, uh, straight into um, Harvey and Vernon. Um, of course, they were about to be chased down by the dogs. At this rate, Sparky was chasing after, along with Beethoven. You know, about to attack Harvey and, and Vernon. <laughs> that sent them back to the cages and. And, of course, Bardnick was about to shoot one of the dogs just as he, just as George jumped into him and beats the crap out of them. But then, um, when the car actually crashes, uh, that's where all these, uh, <laughs> all, all these inject, all, all these medical injections uh, stick directly into uh, Varnick's uh, abs. <laughs> and... Yep, <laughs> you can actually see him smile. So he's already injected. 
Um, so now um, they're about to release all the animals from the cages, all the dogs, and they're about to chase after um, Harvey and Vernon. <laughs> yeah, all the way through the, the factory that was selling all these uh, fruits and produce around. And then suddenly they wind up inside a, a car lot where, some, where they meet all these Dobermans and they're about to attack both uh, Harvey and Vernon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're going around saying, stupid, stupid doggy, stupid, stupid dog. So now, um, for the, the next day or so, uh, Dr. Barnick, along with Harvey and Vernon, were arrested for animal abuse. Yeah, Harvey and Vernon's already, you know, just got to the hospital, already uh, covered up. Um, so now the Newtons are being praised as heroes um, on the news, which takes George to actually change his mind and started to give him a new leaf that now he loves dogs and loves Beethoven. So. That's where Rice finally receives a phone call from her crush, because they just saw the, the news report, and then the Newtons just went back to sleep, joining in with the dogs that they just rescued, so hoping they'll find a new home for them. So, <laughs> so it's a very fun, um, heartwarming uh, comedy that I love. It's a family comedy that was definitely. Uh, worth watching more than once. In fact, you can watch it again and again. It's definitely fast-paced. Uh, it's It has a lot of slapstick in there. and But most of all, I mean, you really care for the family and Beethoven. <laughs> because he's the hero of the St. Bernards. <laughs> yeah. Um, the cast was just excellent, of course. Um, definitely excellent. I mean, and plus, even looking back to the the Noon family, I mean, there's a secret behind George where we learned that even he was a kid before, that he once had a dog, um, where he actually hated his father because he actually took his dog away to be uh, euthanized as well, and he hated him for that. So what do you know? He actually follows his footsteps. So that was really sad, and even he admit that that uh, he felt bad about it. He didn't want this. He, he knew that this was, even though he didn't like him at first, but he realized that um, it was a big mistake. So at that rate, you know, he got used to Beethoven and he likes him more now than he did before. And what, what we really learned about um, his family, though, was that, yeah, they were having problems and but deep down of it, they're actually very nice people, and you really care for them because they, for the situations that they've been going through. Um, and I, I love the fact that that for the the children themselves, I mean, they're actually very nice. They they really care for each other. They take good care of Beethoven. They have their responsibilities, uh, especially that scene where, you know, because of. Um, George's attitude against Beethoven, that he was trying to find a way to actually make it up for it. You know, have him change his mind. Don't don't do this. By actually making breakfast. And and they even clean and wash the Beethoven, giving him a bath so he'd be clean and fresh and hoping that hopefully he'll be able to, you know, change his mind, not not let this happen. But that was certainly the case. When Bardner came along and ruined the whole thing. Um, yeah, and I, I love that too. I mean, they're very likable, very caring. You can really tell. They really love this dog more than ever. ever. And they, they, it also shows that, that Beethoven is very smart and intelligent. He knew that these guys were, were bad people. You know, they were terrible. The way they're treating them. So, I mean, he had a bad experience, so there you go. And also, I, I thought the mother was very caring, too. I mean, really shows. You really trust her, too, because she's right. She really is right. Brad and Bree, I mean, both, you know, David Duchovny and Patricia Heaton, I mean, it's great to see them in, in the film, but 
of course, considering how snobby they are. Um, Dean Jones, on the other hand, I mean, he was incredibly devilishly evil. I mean, the way he looks, the way he talks, I mean, he's very creepy. Um, especially when he wears those glasses. I mean, you see, like, a lot of um, lenses being completely, you know, <laughs> like you can see his eyes getting incredibly bigger. So it's like it's all mirrored. So, like, almost like... Uh, like one of those uh, <laughs> those magnifying glasses. Um, so they were just oh my god. So you could tell how evil he is. Um, as for Oliver Platt and Stanley Tucci, yeah, they were goofy, wacky uh, thieves. Although Harvey uh, actually does love dogs, but he doesn't want to hurt them. That's what I noticed. But hey, Vernon on the other hand just doesn't care. But that's how he is. Um, um, and then there's um, an ammo gun salesman that joined in because apparently he was hired by Burnack because that way he'll be able to use uh, ammunition to actually kill one of them. I mean, that's how sadistic uh, Varnick is. Um, it's edited uh, exactly fast pace. Um, cinematography was just incredibly uh, beautiful, stunning. I mean, the way it was shot. I mean, it's all set in California, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I think it was shot in Pasadena, I believe. It looks like Pasadena, so maybe a little bit of Burbank in there. I don't know. Um, but it's mostly this area. Um, there's even a moment too at the pet store where there was some. Uh, <laughs> there was that one, the uh, one uh, golf chick who just came by. She wanted to to grab a a dog that could be vicious, but apparently he took a the Saint Bernard puppy, which is of course Beethoven, and actually pees on her. <laughs> but they were gonna find another dog for her. That was pretty funny. Um, I mean, and, and of course, the dogs are so cute. I mean, they really are. Um, you felt you felt for them. I'm just glad that you know Newton family got to save them from being killed. You know, by these guys. I mean, they did a lot of horrible stuff. I mean, I love this movie. I always have. It's not not just for nostalgia. Or part of my childhood. I mean, it's, it's far from that. I just think it's a, a very heartwarming, fast-paced, hilarious, wacky comedy that that we'll all love from time to time. And it always be remembered. I just wish critics these days were smart. <laughs> because it just seems like they don't care. But I, I know. I Especially Roger Ebert. I mean, I mean, he's thinking that, oh, it's not a masterpiece, but... Apparently, it's not something that they're expecting anything new to all the dog films we got. I mean, come on. Like, he didn't think, oh, it's not original, or or the fact that even though he does love Charles Grodin as grumpy as he could be, I mean, he felt like, you know, he's probably the only one that's amusing. I mean, I'm, that's just the problem with Roger. But hey, this is the same man who recommended Home Alone Free. <laughs> Or any other film that, or even Cats and Dogs for that matter. That was a terrible film. Yeah, he recommended that film with Roper. Now that's now that's a terrible film compared to Beethoven. Yeah, I know, subjected here, but but if anything, that film is way better than than Cats and Dogs, and that got a sequel too. That's why we. See, that's, that also proves sometimes that, you know, you can't trust them. I mean, you could trust them, but you can't trust what they're saying. But I know, I know it's their opinions. We do respect them. But they have to prove themselves wrong. But, anyway. There's other moments, too, where Beethoven goes around having that Thanksgiving turkey. You know, with Newtons and the rest of the family members joining in. You know, while they're just... Definitely saying grace. 
Um, also some moments too where when they're not around, uh, Beethoven just dicks up and <laughs> just meets um, his friend uh, Sparky. So just hanging around for a while. Or even that one moment too was when Beethoven suddenly went all the way up to the bedroom. Uh, which Alice just came, just checked to see uh, if the TV was on or, or just went to the bathroom. Um, suddenly, because <laughs> what he was turning on was uh, the wolf man that he was watching. Suddenly he went up there, he went up on the bed, was licking uh, George and... <laughs> And he was like talking, thinking that it was Alice, you know, just making love with him. And that's where Alice just came by saying, Who are you talking to? And that's when he found out that it was Beethoven. And then he takes Beethoven back to <laughs> the doghouse. And explained that, you know, you love more than me. Uh, you're, my family loves you more than, than I do. And then, <laughs> then the sprinklers comes out. <laughs> very funny. Has a very classical score by Randy Eldman, the same composer who did Ghostbusters, which is from Ira Reitman. Which makes sense because it definitely has that feel. Um, the most famous one of them all is the opening, which is. Yeah, that theme. Which is also heard in the end credits, and there's other ones that follow. That just sets the mood straight. So you know you're watching a very heartwarming movie. And also, um, the dogs themselves were actually trained and owned by Eleanor Keaton. So, did all the stunts. They had all the doubles for Beethoven. Even both as a puppy and an adult dog. Even though the actor himself is none other than Chris, who passed away in 2007. Yeah, he lived pretty long. Um, lived uh, since he was born in 1989. So he was like um, about um, at the time. Uh, seven, like around 16 or 17, yeah. So, I think we were pretty old. So he was only appearing in the first two films, but that's it. And I, I heard that um, he was actually owned by uh, Levant's sister. So that was her dog. But I learned... But it definitely has a slapstick feel, so I can definitely tell that John Hughes was involved in this. But I guess he didn't want to be, you know, part of it. But he know that he did wrote this because of the witty dialogue it was given. Anyway, but it's a fun comedy. Um, it's it's what it is. <laughs> you know you'll love it, and you'll definitely love uh, the Saint Bernard. I mean, it does make you want to grab a St. Bernard a puppy a, that will grow up to be an adult dog that you'll love and take good care of. I mean, it really does make you love dogs. Too. And other pets. <laughs> Especially if they get into trouble. You know. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that's Beethoven. Roll over Beethoven. Roll over Beethoven. And I give the movie... Five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. And stay tuned for Beethoven's second. Bye.